sound matters. Be heard. Welcome to the podcast where you get exclusive behind the scenes tips to make your own show sound truly spectacular. This is Podtastic Audio. Aloha, everybody. How are you doing? How is your podcast coming along? I am Chris, and I am from the original Chris and Christine Show podcast. You can find out every single thing about that show on a website, which I built all by myself. Yeah, check that out at chrisandchristineshow.com. And just the other day, we released a brand new episode highlighting the crazy adventure that Ezekiel and Christine did after his graduation. You see, they went to Las Vegas as a big surprise. Christine got him backstage to meet and greet some famous comedians. And then as another surprise, she flew him all the way to New York City to see all kinds of cool stuff. Quite an amazing graduation gift, I might say. And then just last week, we were all in Hawaii. We all did the amazing Hawaii stuff that you do in Hawaii, which is, of course, going to the beach, going snorkeling, saw some amazing snorkeling, got some amazing footage of sea turtles, coral, fish, went to the luau, did all the usual Hawaii stuff, and I highly recommend going if you get the chance to. And as you notice on the intro intro of this podcast episode, it sounded like you're sitting right there in Hawaii, and I flew back home, and it's exactly what I did. It's all about theater of the mind. You see, you can tell an amazing story without even having said any words with an audio podcast. Now, it's probably much easier to tell something visually with, you know, a YouTube video or a video thing without actually saying things because you can kind of show the items in the video. But how do you really do that with audio only? How do you set the scene? Well, using sound effects is one way to really go about doing that. But you want to make sure that the sound effects you are using are actually recorded in stereo and that your podcast media host really also publishes your episodes in stereo. You see, just the other day, I found this out the hard way. Not all podcast media hosts actually publish your episodes in stereo. They default to mono. And one of them is Buzzsprout. Yes, no matter what you produce your episodes in, no matter how you record your show, man, even if you record it in stereo with stereo effects and music, if you upload it to Buzzsprout, they automatically default your show to a mono single track use. You don't believe me? Go to your Buzzsprout account right now, physically download your most recent episode that should be in stereo, download it, and then take that same file and drop it into Audacity, and you will see a single mono track. Now, Buzzsprout says that most people who do podcasting just do a regular mono show. Yes, it's a mono vocal as I'm talking to a single microphone right now. It is a mono track. Yes, I get that. But what if I want to do something like I did at the very beginning of this podcast episode? You could not pull that off. If I had a basic account on the old Buzzsprout platform. Now, Buzzsprout does say that if you want to use stereo for your podcast, then you have to pay extra for some kind of like premium features. Uh, Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of other podcasts out there that do not charge to use stereo for their podcast media. Now, just be cautious when you choose a podcast media host. You may think right now, well, I'm never ever going to use uh, stereo. Why would you stereo for anything? I don't do music. I don't do any kind of sound effects. You just never know. And I always like to keep all of your options open just in case, just like having a Rodecaster Pro too. Yeah. You're never going to use all the features on there today. Maybe it's just you talking to a single microphone. Maybe you'll never have a guest in the room with you, but you never know. Always keep your options open. So just the other day, actually right before I flew out of town, to go to Hawaii, I had the opportunity to sit down with David Hooper himself. David Hooper is from Build a Big Podcast, and he is a media marketing expert based in Nashville, Tennessee. He specializes in helping individuals and companies build audiences via broadcasting and podcasting. His latest book is Big Podcast, How to Grow Your Podcast Audience 
build listener loyalty and get everybody talking about your show. And that's exactly the kind of podcasting experts we love to have here on Podcasting Audio. So please enjoy my conversation with David Hooper. You have been in the radio business and music business for like a very long time. When did you get your start? It's a say in music in general. <laughs> well, I grew up in Nashville. So everybody here is born with a guitar. And that was what I saw growing up. It's not unlike being in Detroit, seeing the automotive business, or you're in San Diego, you see the surfing business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I was always around music. And because of that, one of the reasons that Nashville is Music City USA was because we had a big radio tower here, WSM, that would reach Canada. It would go down to Mexico. And we had stations that would go into the Bahamas. And if you wonder why, when you listen to reggae music, there's tinges of country music, some kind of twang. That is because of the media coming out of Nashville. So I've always really been involved in both, if you consider just the community that I grew up in. But, you know, uh, started singing in the church choir. I mean, everybody does music around here. So learned music in church. And then eventually decided I wanted to be a rock star and went to college for music. And nice. that's how I fell into radio. So when you were in school, did you take like a, was it a music dedicated college or just a class in college? No, I've got a bachelor of music. So I was like a commercial, well, specifically commercial music, which is the, the business of music, but it is a bachelor of music. So yeah, I was taking music theory, jazz theory, oral theory, uh, everything, piano, I play bass, guitar, drums. So what's your favorite instrument to play? I still play guitar a little bit, and that's nice because you can take it anywhere. And Well, not like a harmonica, buddy. The harmonica you can take anywhere, really. I actually, you know, <laughs> harmonica is one of the instruments that I started on. That was back when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a good first instrument. It's, I don't know, they're probably 20, 30 bucks now. Oh, yeah. I, I, had, one, I had one, too. Yeah. That and the kazoo, I think, was... Uh... Sure, sure. <laughs> So what's yeah, this like mouth harp, you know, we, oh, yeah. we had those two. I chipped a tooth on one of those when I was no. a kid. So how'd yeah. you do that? When well, you fling that uh, piece of metal back, boing, boing, and it just popped back and chipped tooth. God, man, that's, uh, <laughs> you got to fix now, right? I mean, you're not, you know, well, yeah, it was baby tooth, man. It was, I was oh, young. <laughs> gotcha. So what does I hear about when you're really young, five years old, recording a first album? How'd, I you, did. Even, how'd you do that? Well, as I mentioned, I grew up doing church music. And this is something you'll see. Well, you see it in a lot of churches, but definitely Southern churches. So I started taking music when I was in kindergarten. They had a program called Kinder Music. And I live right down the street. I'm actually still down the street from me from United Methodist Publishing. And they needed some voices on a record. So they say, hey, you guys got some kids who can sing. And the church said, yep. And they dragged me and my buddies down there and we sang on a record. Nice. Was it any good? Did it go anywhere? I never heard it. I just remember it being really, really long. I was not used to doing take after take after take oh, after take right, after take. Yeah. And it was a really long day. It seemed like it was long. It could have been an hour for all I know, but it seemed like it was all day. I was used to doing a performance because I was, you know, five years old, man. Right, I never yeah. got paid for it. I know that. So uh, if you see the Methodists, let them know they still owe me money. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure that it was actually ever released. I imagine that it probably was, but that's one of the things, and, and we experience this right now in podcasting and, and YouTube and having the phone in our pocket that can record everything. They record so much and we record so much that a lot of it just never sees the light of day. And I think that's maybe the, the thing that we need to figure out, like what should we release and what should we not release? Back in the day, you would make a decision because you had vinyl and stampers and trucks and stores and there was only so much you could put out and these days people are like yeah it's content put it out it's like eh, maybe not well everybody's trying to get that one quick viral thing to, you know and nobody really knows like they think this might be the one video that goes viral that maybe it is maybe it's not i don't know they're trying to chase yeah. the next thing a lot of people are yeah. yeah yeah so so then you went into radio like right after college I got into radio during college and that was directly related to my music because first day of college or the first week, it was my first semester. I walked into a radio class. I wanted to have my music on the radio because I was but in don't, a band. Don't we all? Don't we yeah. all, man? <laughs> well, and they are going around the room. Professor is like, why are you here? I said, well, I'm in a band and I want to play my music on the radio. He said, what kind of music? Rock and roll. So I said, rock and roll. He said, we don't play rock and roll. 
on this station, the campus station. And that's also illegal. It's called what? Plugola. Oh yeah, you can't play your own stuff. You can't play anything or plug. This is why it's Plugola, not Paola. Paola is where you pay to have music played. And Plugola is when you're plugging your own stuff or something you have a financial involvement with. So he says, uh, that's Plugola and you can't do that either. <laughs> but I stuck it out, man. I stuck it out and ended up getting into production very on. Even that first semester, I was starting to do documentaries and DJ work, uh, hosting, and stuck it out. A lot of my radio career, though, early on was in record promotion. That's where I learned about Paola, <laughs> getting records played. But then I got back into it 2000. Well, I, I, I had a post-college uh, radio thing, and then I had it about uh, 15 years later from, from that first day, 14 years later. Fantastic, man. I love radio. I love all things audio. In fact, for me, I've always I've always gravitated towards the audio side of things, the radio oh, yeah. side of things. Radio yeah. is very intimate. It's a very personal connection. Same with podcasting, too. And yeah. I, I really appreciate the audio side of podcasting. I'm a big fan of the video side of podcasting. But what are your thoughts on those who are trying to do both or trying to do this whole video side with the YouTube thing with their podcast or audio content, really? Well, YouTube, I would argue that it's not a podcast. YouTube is what? YouTube. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and, and I don't, you know, plant my flag and get mad about it. The, a, lot of, a lot of the other middle-aged white guys, like, if it's not an RSS feed, it's not a podcast. That's right. <laughs> I, I don't worry about that. But I think YouTube is its own thing. It's its own animal. The way you play the YouTube game, it's basically a, a television network with a bajillion videos on it. And you need to be discovered. It's not broadcast. It's super ultra niche. And that's one of the things that I love about it. And I think that people love about online things. But podcasting, that is usually a longer experience with somebody. People would argue that it's maybe more intimate because of that. You are injecting yourself into the background noise of people's lives. For example, if I'm working out or if I'm walking or driving or cooking in the kitchen, I might be listening to a podcast because I can just listen. So that's injecting that into my life and in some ways more intimate than, you know, sitting on the toilet, looking at YouTube videos or whatever, <laughs> you know, and, and, right, and scrolling yeah. from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. When I listen to a podcast, such as Podtastic Audio, I listen to your stuff before I came on here and you've got stuff that is interviewing people and you've got your own stuff, but I don't think I saw anything that might've been less than 12 minutes, 20 minutes. And there was some stuff that went on a lot longer than that. And that's a lot longer, even if it were 12 minutes on the, the small end, uh, that's a lot longer than a lot of people are looking at with YouTube and certainly with shorts or with TikTok or with some of the Instagram videos. Yeah, I think the algorithm counts a view on TikTok, Instagram. I think it's like one second, maybe. It's got to be super short because some of those videos yeah. are like five seconds long, yeah. you know, and they're yeah. just flicking through it with their thumb. Like, look at it for a second, flick it up, flick it well, up. And that's cool, right? I, I really love the guys that are doing something like TikTok. And I love the guys that are doing the short form reels or stories or shorts. I think there's a super amazing talent to be able to convey a message. We do this in music. We do it and we used to say it was 3.30. That's the length of a song, a perfect song, 3.30. Nowadays, songs might be two minutes. And a lot of that does have to do with people on Instagram or people on whatever, Spotify, however they get their music. But at the same time, if you really look at your hardcore YouTubers, this is where audio, it, it basically breaks down the fantasy of it. I'm sorry, let me, say, let me say that again. This is where video breaks down the fantasy. You and I can chop things out. Like, I don't know if you're going to leave that you clearing your throat in, but if you didn't hear that, everybody, Chris just cleared his throat. <laughs> the magic of editing, buddy. <laughs> right, the magic of editing. But on video, right, if I couldn't keep a thought together, I see guys on YouTube, and because it's video, you can see chop, 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 chop. For a 30-second message, they've chopped it up 10 times. And that is a completely different thing than what you or I would do on audio. Hopefully, you're going to be able to have a 30-second message without edit edits. Just mess that up. I, I jinxed my own thing, but... It happens, you know, it happens. And you, there's no escaping that when it's video. I think it, video is in some ways, uh, it's too exposing. 
It, it is. And I think a lot of people I've heard a tip if you're going to do like the Zoom show um, and you take the audio version, you make that sound great. You do all the edits, make it sound phenomenal. And you take the video version, just slap that ad in on YouTube as is because with those jump cuts, like you say, they do get a little distracting when you're watching a lot of jump cuts, jump, jump edits, you know? Well, it makes people nervous. This is another thing that I've learned with audio, especially audio books. You want the breaths in there because breathing you're not in the same room, Chris, you're going to hear me breathe. I'm going to hear you breathe. It lets us know when to pause. It lets us know when to perk up and pay attention. It lets us know where the other person is. A lot of times you'll hear people to cut out all the breaths and that's not natural. And we see this in music. There are various ways that this happens. Quantizing beats. If people are familiar with that, quantizing beats is put, putting it on the grid. It's a perfect boom, 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 a hundred milliseconds apart or something like that. Real humans we are not that perfect. Our clock, meter, it's going to be just a little bit off. That's what makes it funky. And that is what we're listening for and what we think of when we think of a human experience. We don't want something that's perfect. We want something that's real and authentic. So when it comes to podcast audio, uh, what would be too distracting for you for you know to take away from, say, someone's content? Heavy breathing. Yeah, <laughs> there's... A- <laughs> I know I'm just talking about leaving the breaths in, right? There we go. But if you're going to get in there like ludicrous or, you know, having like your emphysema, like, like, you know, you you can't breathe. A lot of people edit with Descript and Descript is amazing. It's a great tool, but Descript, if you're not familiar with it, Descript lets you edit like it's a word document. You're not listening. You're watching something. You're looking at the text. And what that will do is that'll chop things off in the middle of breaths. So in the middle of a sentence, let's say I pause there, I might have two breaths in there because I'm pausing to think about the next second, the next segment, and it chops them together and it cuts them off and it compresses them. And that's super distracting. That's almost as bad as the jump cuts when you have weird breath sounds. The other thing about audio too would be if you're going to chop off words, the script will do that, chop off the end of them, leave slivers, leave slices, um, any, any, kind of, any kind of audio processing where it doesn't sound like a normal person talking, like a de for example, the word podcast has an S on it, and podcasts has two. And if you use your de which takes that S out, it will come out like podcat, like you, <laughs> like you got a cold. Right, yeah. And yeah. that's distracting. So people can way overcompress it. I know people love a good radio voice. And that's oh, I love it the, too, man. Oh, sure. We all do, right? Especially if you're like me, I'm 50 years old. I grew up around that. Turn it up and rip the knob off. <laughs> we love that yeah. kind of stuff. That big voice of God booming thing. And the issue that we face as podcasters is we're used to hearing our compressed voice. And it's almost like a, a person wearing perfume. You get used to the perfume. You keep putting on a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And you're not, you're not used to yourself without it. And then you're blowing out everybody else. Because you've got so much of it, you've become yeah, immune the, to it. Yeah, the axe killer. Yeah. <laughs> 100% it is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that guy in the club who's got, uh, you know, a whole bottle of it on him. And <laughs> he's got no idea. And everybody else standing five, ten feet away and they're still smelling it. So, you know, you've got to be really close uh, to our stuff. This is one of the reasons I would suggest that podcasters audit or edit their own stuff. A- and audit as well. Like really listen to your stuff and not just say like, well, this is uncomfortable for me or it doesn't need to be edited. You're going to be a better host when you I edit I want to yourself. keep it live, man. I want to keep it natural. I want to yeah, keep it real. Well, I want to keep it fresh. Man, we, right. we stream yard this thing every Wednesday at noon. And- well, and that's cool. <laughs> hey, look, that's fun too. Live radio is great because of the imperfections like that. Just like NASCAR, you're going to maybe crash a car. That kind of makes it fun, right? But there's also an opportunity once you're done with that stream to go back and edit it out and edit out the parts that don't work. Cause you'll know what doesn't work. You'll get better at doing that in your head. Sometimes the conversation lulls or somebody went on for too long. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just assume that uh, the podcast you're listening right now, thank you, is actually does have a, a great show and it's put together, you know, a nice package to edit. It makes it sound great. So how would one possibly build that to create a bigger audience? All right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to go back and we're going to, you're assuming they're doing some things right. So let's look at what I would suggest people do right. Because I'm not sure when you say great show, a lot of people think they've got a great show because they're involved, but that 
is definitely not enough for other people to be involved with it. It's really difficult, I think, for people to understand that. I remember, though, being a musician. I put out my first record. I had a record label. This is in the 90s. And I was so proud of this record. And I'd worked really hard on it. We pressed 1,000 CDs. And I was going around and trying to get people to buy them. And people were like, eh, you know, you want me to invest $10 in this? I was like, you know, you don't understand. You're going to really like, this is the best. This is the best. You know, people are like, eh. And that's a hard lesson that I don't think a lot of people, un- unfortunately, uh, learn quickly enough, is that you really got to make it about the person buying. It can't just be about you and just because your involvement. So I would say, if we're looking to build a podcast audience, we need to look at what is in it for those person, for those people. Chris, you're going to have a lot of edits on this, or are we going to keep it real? Either way. Uh, I, I haven't <laughs> decided yet, so we'll, we'll find okay. out at the end. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing I would do, if, if I were a podcaster and you want somebody to listen, the first thing that people want when they listen to a host is they want to know where the host stands. They want to know what they're going to get. It's like a McDonald's. I'm a vegetarian, Chris. I haven't been in a McDonald's for I mean, once or twice in the last 25 years. Oh, so I shouldn't ask you what the best barbecue place is in uh, Nashville? No, no, I wouldn't know. I would <laughs> yeah. not know. But I, I do know this, that even though I haven't been in a McDonald's for 25 years, except for a couple of times, I know where the bathrooms are. I know how to order. I know value meal, one, two, three, four. You know, I know the basic process because they've got the thing systematized. I know what I'm going to get when I go to a McDonald's. It's funny you mentioned barbecue. There's a, I don't go to barbecue places. Why? Because I'm vegetarian. I know what I'm going to get and I know it's not for me. And because I know that, that's actually a really good thing. I can go on to the vegetarian place and somebody like you, I'm assuming you like barbecue, that's going to open the thing up for you and you're going to have your experience and I'm going to have mine. But it's going to be weird if I go to a barbecue place and I said, um, hey, do you guys have any like tofu? And they're like, what? <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's not a good experience for anybody. They're not prepared for it. They don't want to serve it. And I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, and then I'm going to be like, oh, this isn't how to do tofu. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They screw so, that up. So, yeah. So that's going to be the first thing. I mean, you really need to let people know what you're going to get or what they're going to get. And it, it comes with flying your flag. And, and you're going to do that through a description in iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Spotify, whatever they call these things now. You're going to put your description there. It's going to be how you open up the podcast. You did it in a certain way. It's letting people know what they're going to get. It's going to be your art. It's going to be the voiceover that you use, your online podcasting personality. It is going to be the music that you choose. It really is going back in service of that, of like letting know people, letting people know what they're getting and letting them know, yeah, you're in the right place or you're in the wrong place. Go. Go. <laughs> There's a door. Get out of here. Well, well, and, and, and it's not, it's not a bad thing, right? Some people say, well, I'm, I'm eight to 88. I'm for everybody. I'm, I'm for humans, David. I'm, I just, I podcast for humans. <laughs> yeah. And that's the most milk toast stuff. That's great for broadcast radio, but even broadcast radio, if you were to go to San Diego and, and go up and down the dial, you're going to hear probably some, imagine uh, something Spanish language. You're oh, going to yeah. hear Christian radio. You're going to have rock. You're going to hear rap and urban pop. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You you know, and, and, and you're going to hear that in the voices that you hear, you're going to hear that what's advertised that that's, if we were to be, to be really honest, that's why we have this, uh, niched out media is strictly because of advertising. It makes it easier for people to sell stuff. And those guys got it before I think music fans do. Cause some people like, like me, music fans, we like a little bit of everything, but I still like if I'm going to the club, I'm going to turn on a certain station beforehand. If I want to hear jazz and relax, I'm going to turn on a certain station, you know? So it's, yeah. it's ni- nice to know what you're going to get before you go in there. Yeah, that is, that is very true. And I think a lot of shows, they try to do this. Uh, my show is for everybody or, or I want to try to, you know, pitch it out to everybody. And I mean, I'm sure you get these too. You'll get some podcasts. You'll say, Hey, check out my show, you know, and give me a like, or give me a review. And I, and I look at the show. I'm like, well, I would never listen to that show anyways. It's not my taste. So, uh, yeah. you know, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I try to be nice about it. Oh, okay. You know, whatever. <laughs> but, well, yeah. sometimes when people come to you and I think we have to worry, uh, be aware of this when we're podcasters, we, we have to say, are we really interested in somebody's opinion or do we just want somebody to say that it, it's going to be okay and they like our stuff? Like, oh, it's, it's perfect, Chris. I wouldn't change a thing. Is that what you're looking for? Or are you looking to 
be helped or are you looking to just have encouragement because podcasting is tough? I mean, I'm sitting here in a tricked out walk-in closet by myself. I'm assuming you've got a similar situation where you are. It's not tricked out. Let me tell you, dude, this is a, <laughs> it's a, it's our guest bedroom downstairs with tile floors, which is horrible. It's, wow. got, a, it's got a futon that's um, actually folded out. We had someone staying with us uh, over the week and um, it's just office, you know, desk type yeah. stuff. Yeah. It, it's not glamorous though. Right. But if you were he to hear us and if I didn't let people in on that, you might think we we're in the same room. It is a very well, you lonely are, hey, existence. Thanks for, hey, thanks for bringing me the coffee. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very lonely existence though, right? I mean, we we have to, you've got to book me. I've got to figure out how to get here. We might have technical issues. You've got to edit. You've got to publish. You've got to get rejected. You've got to go to those people and say, hey, I got something for everybody. And they say, mm, Chris, I don't want something for everybody. I want something for me. I mean, it's it's really tough. So I think as podcasters, a lot of times we give, 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 give that energy, but don't have have that energy coming back. And I do think it's important, but that's one of the reasons that you really want to niche down and fly your flag is because you want your people, not just everybody. We don't want just warm bodies in there. That's what we get into when we get into YouTube or what we get into when we're thinking about downloads. How I many downloads or likes? That's generic. Like we, we're not broadcasting for likes and downloads. We're broadcasting to real people. We want real interaction with them. We want them to come up to me or come up to you and say, man, Chris, I heard this and it changed my life. Wow. That's what we want. We want relationships. We want to have impact. You know, and some people probably want downloads, but believe me, I mean, I take it back to that 1000 CDs thing that a guy told me this, uh, <laughs> record label guy. And he said, um, he was talking a little more. He's talking about 10,000 because any, anybody who thinks 10,000 records is not a lot of records has never seen 10,000 records in the van where you, you, you got to go sell them, man. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I would say the same thing with a thousand. We, you know, if I were to say I get a thousand downloads on my podcast, people are like, yeah, that's not much. I get a million on my YouTube video. It's like, okay, cool, cool. I mean, a lot of viral videos do that. Then they just disappear. But a thousand is where you have impact, man. A thousand, is that like the magic number where things kind of change for you as a podcaster? Well, I don't think it's where things can change for you necessarily. It could be 500, it could be 300. But if you think about it, if you've got people just coming to you show after show after show, you could do it with a thousand people. Yeah. All the time. If you've got like an event that you do, if you've got a book that you release, if you've got a coaching program or some kind of business on the back end, you don't need that many people. The numbers can work and you can make it happen. But, you know, that's the foundation. And that's the kind of people that you really want listening to you anyway, because those are the people that are going to have that great experience and they're going to go to their buddies. You're going to say, you wouldn't believe it. I heard this guy named Chris out of San Diego and it was super helpful. You're starting a podcast. Maybe he would help you too. As opposed to the YouTube guy or a thousand or 20,000 YouTube guys that have just gone on to the next thing, the Island Boys or Call Her Daddy or whatever the next thing that pops up on YouTube is. Right. Yeah. It's all about uh, trying to get the clicks. Click, click, yeah. clicks and the plays yeah. and all that stuff. I know some uh, some podcasters, it's almost kind of deflating when you see a lot of the podcasters will brag on social media. Oh, I hit my first 10,000 plays or 20,000 plays or, yeah, 50, or whatever I mean, it is. Uh, I would say congratulations, good job on you, but, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's all you, or you'll see the ones that'll be like their first 10 plays and they get super excited and I'll say congratulations to that too. I was trying to support and help out the best way, you know, I can, but. Yeah. I will tell you a funny story. You might know this song. There's a guy named Christopher Cross. Oh, I know the guy. Yeah. Okay. He's a song called Sailing, Ride Like the Wind. And I was doing an event with Chris, I call him Chris Cross but it's not warm. And then Christopher Cross is who right, I'm talking about. Right, yeah, of about. course. And he, I, I had not heard this story, but there was somebody who asked him this, and I thought it was really interesting. After Ride Like the Wind came out, because he won, I think it was Album of the Year, Artist of the Year. He came out of nowhere. This record called, or it was a movie called Arthur, Arthur, Arthur and Arthur's theme. Anyway, so he had some big hits, and there was a time when you could just not get away from this dude. So, you know, Probably ego got the best of him. He's winning all this best new artists, best new artists. And we call this sophomore slump in music where you've got this big album that hits and then the second album, eh, not so much. The reason for that is your first record, you might have worked on it five, 10 years. They're taking the best of the best of the best. It's been tested. People are already into it. We know it's going to work. That second album is always rushed. So somebody asked him about this experience of getting all these I guess he had like some kind of, um, what, what would you call it? Like a shrine 
to the Grammys he won and all these other awards that he had won. And he had them backlit and they looked great. And uh, eventually he it took them down and, and just threw them in the closet or something. Like, I, this, this is keeping me from doing what I want to do. And they asked him about that. Is that story true? He said, yes. And what I am doing now, and this is why I bring it up when you're congratulating the person who has 10 listens as well as 10,000. And I think we need to do this to ourselves. Is he said, I've got them on the mantle, but it's next to my wife's PTA certificate recognition. It's next to my kid's T-ball little league trophy. It's, not, it's, just, it's just another trophy. This is what our family does. And I think that's a great way of looking at it. Because nice. it's not, it, it's, podcasting is just a job. Music is just a job. And are you doing it? Yeah, but it's not like you can't have more impact than anybody else doing another job. And it's not like you can't have impact with just a few people. For that PTA, for example, let's say that was his wife in the PTA, that's huge impact on those kids and it's huge impact on the school and the neighborhood. And it doesn't mean that that's not as important as music or, you know, and for us it's podcasting too. I think it fl- flips that, right? It's our podcast can be as important as a major radio or major movie or it just depends. Yeah, it just it depends. And um, I mean, I love audio, I love podcasts, I love helping podcasters out. And if they have any questions about different things and tips and tricks, um, just earlier today, someone said something about, um, this thing kind of pisses me off. I think he mentioned, you want to know if anybody was down to do a review swap? God, I hate, oh, yeah. I hate those. I hate those so much because it's because I think that they're just looking for someone to say five stars, shows great, yeah. love the host, without any real, you know, feedback or any. Re- yeah, it's not a real review. It's just it's trying to get social proof so he can build hype. And yeah, you see that sometimes. I don't see that nearly as much as I used to, and I don't know why. I don't know why if it's if there's such a, or maybe it's going on covertly, you know, because there is such a stigma with it. Yeah, I mean, this one guy came out to us and he asked for a review. He's all sweet and nice, and he wanted to do the review swap and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't really do that. And he got kind of pissed off or whatever. And I'm like, well, I don't, you know, like, like I don't do that because it's all it's fake. It's not a real review. It's, I just called him out on it. And then he, got, I look at his reviews. He had like a thousand five star reviews. They're all the same thing. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I wonder where you're getting those from. And just yesterday or two days ago, a podcaster just posted, I can't believe she even did this, but she hired a PR like promotions team out of a Fiverr from another country who knows where. And, um, (laughs) well, probably not a good one if it's from Fiverr, but okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Fiverr, all the best podcast uh, production stuff comes from. And, (laughs) and so I guess something backfired. Um, they went to go leave or something or quit or use another different Fiverr person or something. So that original you know, promotion team decided to just write all these negative one-star reviews on their podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I've heard rumors of that. I've never actually seen it happen. But yeah, I, you know, it's, um, you got to watch. You got to watch the people that you do business with. And it. the funny thing is, it, it, is it probably, I don't know if it even matters. You know, I, I, I never listened to, I never, I take that, I'm getting my verbs wrong. I never read reviews before I actually listen, I can listen to a podcast for free. So why not? You know, it's like, we all kind of know that a lot of Amazon reviews are fake. And I will tell you this, that the way reviews work from my experience is something called twinning mentioned being 50 years old, vegetarian from Nashville, grew up in the church. If I see a review and it says, Hey, I'm a 50 year old guy. I'm from the South. I don't like barbecue. I grew up in the church. I did my first record when I was six. I'm going to wait, wait a minute, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to read that guy's stuff, you know? So sometimes reviews can work like that, but again, it gets to this one-to-one kind of thing that I'm talking about, the relationship that you've got with your listeners. It's not necessarily the numbers because sometimes, I mean, I always kind of look at it like if something's really popular, whether it's music or a podcast, I'm like, eh, it's probably not for me because I'm not like the general public. Oh, that's a good point. Um, and your point on the reviews, um, there's probably a, um, I don't know, five or seven podcasts that I listen to regularly every single week when they're, when they come up. And I can yeah. tell you that I've never looked at the reviews ever. You've probably never been to the website. That's another thing people get caught up on. I think it's important to have a website, but for years, years, I just let Lipson, which is where I host, just use their built-in website. Shout out Lipson. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was fine. It, it doesn't really matter because it's an audio medium. It's not a, a, a website medium. It Again, it's important to have a place to go. I think you should have your own domain name. 
But when it comes to, I, I, I was working with a guy, he said, man, dude, I just hired this company. It's like $10,000 for a website. I said, what? <laughs> what? Dude, dude, give me an hour on Squarespace and I could come up with something that's fine. Right. But, well, you know, but, yeah. but people, people though, I think what we do is we wait until everything is perfect or we think it has to be that next thing. And I'm guilty of this too. I've got a huge book. It's called Big Podcast. It's 500 pages almost. And uh, 93,000 words. The original version was 125,000 words. I had to edit it down just like my podcast. But I came out with a big book like that because I was transferring from music to podcasting and spreading messages with audio in a different way. I said, you know, I need something where I can, bam, slap that thing down on the desk and people are going to take me seriously. But if you looked at it, it's like, well, wait a minute. I've been doing radio for, I mean, at that point, I've been doing the syndicated show for 10 years every week. And if you really went back to that first day in college, you know, I'd, I'd had, um, I'm doing the math now, like uh, almost 25 years, which is really kind of weird to think about. It's <laughs> yeah, a long time. It is, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But when you're in it though, you don't think about it. And I think we all get into that thinking like we need that next thing and we need that endorsement. But I can tell you this is that, and this is coming from somebody working in the entertainment industry is that we'll use Christopher Cross as an example. It's like, you can win that Grammy, you can have that platinum record, but it really doesn't change a thing. It doesn't. And you still got to go back the next morning or you can sit there and not do what you're doing and just live off the money for a little while. But I mean, I think internally, I don't think those external things change that much. I think it has to come from the inside. And that gets back to us, you in the guest bedroom, me in my tricked out closet. We still got to show up, you know, and we can do that right now. or We can wait till things are perfect. But either way, we're still going to have to show up. Speaking of showing up, you, uh, you do a lot of uh, interviews for uh, on the radio via celebrities, musicians, things like that, right? Yeah. Did one yesterday. Oh, okay. So on that note, who is the most famous celebrity you've interviewed in person? Um, that would be hard to say. I, I'll tell you, uh, let me tell you a funny story because this is, this is involving booking. I wrote Richard Marks, who is the eighties crooner and has written a lot of well-known songs, lives next to Barbara Streisand. He is married to Daisy Fuentes, if you remember MTV from the 90s. Oh, yeah. I follow her on uh, Instagram or something. She's got her own <laughs> brand. Yeah, these two were doing real well. And I just sent him a message on Twitter. I, I, I had heard he was in Nashville doing songwriting. He's a big writer. And so I was like, hey, man, you know, heard you're, heard you're in Nashville. You know, we've got this show. I, I'd love to get connected with you. Next thing I know, I get a message from his assistant. And within a week, Richard Marks, by himself, with a guitar case is walking into my studio. And I think that's an example of what happens. If you don't ask, don't get, you know, right, I'm yeah. still waiting for Dolly Parton to return my call. Oh but. yeah. Well, <laughs> I got a number. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. If you can get her, if you can get her, I would love that. But it, you know, I, I think like, yeah, there's a lot of people that come through my show. I'm really lucky in that the broadcast show, as the name would suggest it, we started with a broadcast company and, and they have since sold all but one station. So we're still affiliated with the station, but it's the number one AAA station in the country. And it has been for six years in a row. So a lot of times just, it's not me, it's the station and people okay. want to be associated with it. So I've got access to a lot of people that other people wouldn't have. Like we get pitched all the time. Like it's like, Hey, do you want to interview the guy from Judas priest? I like, I had nothing to do with that. And it's like, yeah, cool. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, a lot of these guys, they'll come through. Uh, Dave Stewart from Eurythmics, I was on a, uh, I guess it was a vi some kind of video. Uh, I don't know, he's some kind of behind the scenes thing. He was releasing a record. He's been through, we've had a lot of people that have, I, I had to, uh, the woman yesterday was a, a woman you would not have heard of, but she's got a top 10 on the meta chart on the viral video. Kim Kardashian just used her song in a video. and just blew up like 2 million plays overnight. So wow. that's just, and, and, and that's one of a thousand songs that she's had placed. So a lot of it is not necessarily famous people, but they are interesting people. And that's where I get a lot of my philosophy as far as what it means to show up. Cause I've seen fame come and go for a lot of people, you know? It's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, have you seen a lot it, of the, um, have, you, have you ever you interviewed somebody that was like a one hit wonder, but they thought this train ride was going to last forever and just crashed like the next year or two years there was like um, obsolete. I tell, I, you know what? I'll tell, I'll tell you a funny story. A woman named Valerie Day, I did an interview with her. 
And there was a song, it says, baby, I can't wait. You know that song? I think so. I think so. All right, well, I'll tell you this. Last year, it was the single for Snoop Dogg. It's been sampled over a hundred times. I just heard it, no lie, on my Spotify new release playlist. It gets sampled. It is like the baseline that has changed everything. Um, I mean, in music, it gets sampled on top of sampled. And I've got guys like that that are more often than not, you would think that they were one-hit wonders, but it turned, they, they show up in a solid gold car and the stuff has been sampled or re-recorded or, I mean, it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, there are definitely some people that if you ask them, and I was the same way, dude. I had some early success with some projects that I did. And you think, oh man, I figured it out and I'm, I'm good. You know, whether it's just online stuff that I'm selling or, or books or music that I was involved with. And you think you figured it out. And what I think most people realize that, n- no, it, do- it doesn't last. And sometimes you're lucky and 30 years later, somebody's still sampling you. But most of those guys are still waking up and they're still working. I, I do think that early on, though, a lot of people they, they think they can just do it again. I see this a lot of time in the rap world. A lot of those guys get taken advantage of with, Oh man, they get their, uh, it'll be just like a buyout. Like a lot of times people will, they'll want to just do like a, um, work for hire. Yeah. Anyway. And, and that, that's usually a bad idea. That's usually, it's much better to own your stuff. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of the new podcasters, the YouTubers are understanding. You hear this IP I was like, how do you know what IP is? Intellectual property is what it means. And we've known that in music forever. So that's, that's important to own your stuff if you can, because that, that's potentially a lot of money. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, I like, I mean, for being an independent podcaster, like I am, you know, I have no boss, you know, riding over right. me for this show or even the right. Chris Christine show. Like I, like we were taking a small break with that show and we were not held to any sponsors. Well, of course we don't have sponsors, but but we don't have anybody that we have to answer to. So we can kind of write our own thing and do with things on our time schedule and things that we want to do when we want to do it. So yeah, um, that's really important. I think, I think it's important. I think the downside of it is like, sometimes people are better off with a boss, somebody who's kind of pushing them like, Hey man, we need you to show up at 9am tomorrow. I, I do think you have to be what people used to call a self-starter because it's easy to kind of slack off and be like, oh, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. Yes, but, of course. But the, the, that's the interesting thing. And the guys, like I talked about the woman from yesterday, a thousand placements, meaning a thousand of those Kim Kardashian things. She's done ads for AT&T, T-Mobile, Gucci, who knows? I mean, sound, you've probably heard her music used without even knowing her. And she talks about, yeah, getting up, I go and hit the coffee shop that I'm in the studio writing by 9 a.m. and I treat it like a job. Like, well, wow. yeah, I, I know that, uh, I mean, with podcasting, you probably should treat it a little bit like a job. So I know when you have, say, just the purely hobby podcast, it's three dudes in a basement drinking beer talking about their latest, you know, Batman movie or whatever yeah. they're doing. And yeah. they want to transition that show into a quote unquote business style show, maybe get sponsors. How would one go about that? Dave Jackson calls that the three guys, one brain. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's funny you have your example of talking about Batman because I always talk about the guys in, not not drinking beer but getting high and arguing over the best flavor of Doritos. You know, it's just like that kind of <laughs> oh, silly what show. What show. show is that, man? The Dorito show? Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, oh man, I love Cool Ranch. You know, that kind of stuff is fun. I don't know if, if it necessarily stands out. I think sometimes that's maybe all podcasting needs to be is a chance for you and your buddies to hang. And that's the joke is that if you want to have a man open up, put a mic in front of him and tell him it's a podcast. Yeah. Because men, you know, men, we have this thing, reputation, like, oh, men never talk. It's like, well, tell him it's a podcast. He'll, t- he'll share his feelings. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, uh, I don't know for something like that. I mean, I think, I think for something like that, that's really talent based. If you have the talent, that would, would probably be better served as a broadcast show, something like Sirius XM. And these places are available to you. And certainly Podcast One, Spotify those guys have more of a reach that they can put that in front of people. And it's sort of something for everybody. It, it sounds like it's maybe niched out, but it's kind of the general show. I would call that more broadcasting. The issue that you're going to face is that with radio changing like it is, and with a lot of stuff being syndicated, for example, and this is an interesting story about radio. If you remember Howard Stern used to be on broadcast radio. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, he and then he quit. Switched. Yeah. 
yeah, he went to Sirius XM or XM or Sirius and then it merged, whatever he, wherever he is. So when they came back with, it was David Lee Roth on one side of the country and I can't remember who the other person was. But the reason they did that was because they did not want one person having that much power over all those stations. They wanted to be able to control it and not have, you know, contractual issues. Because at Stern at one time, he was really the king of all media. And if you walked, you know, you're in trouble on that many stations. So, you know, radio has changed, I think, because of that. They, They still have syndication, but there are a lot of different syndicated things, those smaller units that maybe Stern was in. There's 10 guys doing it now or 20 guys doing it now. That's good work if you can get it. It's really a lot of pressure and the guys that have been doing it since Stern was doing it. And Stern's been doing it for since the seventies, I guess. I don't know. I'll watch the eighties, maybe. But definitely the eighties. Yeah. So you're talking a good 40 years in still doing it, still doing it at a very strong level. If you look at the guys like Limbaugh, I talk about Limbaugh in my book. I've actually got old air checks of Limbaugh. If you go to the site, big podcast, you can hear him playing pop music in 1971. And no he's, way. he's of course passed now, but you know, he had a good 50 year career in radio, but he started doing pop music and giving away movie tickets and doing the stuff like we all do. And You know, you're competing against guys like that, assuming they're still around, that still love radio, and that would be pretty tough. So sometimes I think it can be better to just have a a niche thing. For those guys, I would suggest go meet people live and do a live event and get in touch with But it's hard if you have have a small audience, if you want to go do a live thing or something. Well, okay, so you're... Okay, two ways to do a live event, though, right? So you're talking about if they already have an existing audience bringing those people into a live event. I'll give you an example. There's a paranormal conference here in Nashville. And if you've got something where you're talking about ghost stories, you're talking about whatever, I got murdered by a ghost. That'd be a good one, right? Yeah. Go to the paranormal conference. They've already got the paranormal people. So if your guys are talking about Batman, now that we've got these writers on strike and actors on strike that can't go to the Batman Comic-Con conference, you are the guy Cross that picket line, buddy, you know, get in there and, and, and do your podcast at Comic-Con and do things live and build your own audience like that. Cause they've got people there that are interested in what you're talking about. Oh yeah. This city goes nuts. Comic-Con. Every, oh, you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never been, I've always wanted to get tickets, but it's like literally impossible to get to. Well, it's a good year now. Cause those actors might not show up if they're on strike. <laughs> Yeah, I heard a lot of people, I think Marvel said they're quit and they're not doing a panel or something, which is nuts because Marvel always does like this big, massive panel, you know? Well, and, you know, that's that. borrowing an audience. That's that's what that is. And if you could get there and if you've got to rent a booth or you've got to do something, that's borrowing an existing audience. And there's nothing better. I'm doing a live event tonight and there's nothing better when it comes to, I, I look at it as census. We've been talking about audio only, but a live event, people can see you. They can taste you. They want to lick you. They can touch you. They can smell you. <laughs> That's all too much. Okay. <laughs> you know, but they can hit all those senses and they're really going to be connected to you and they get to see the enthusiasm and that doesn't translate into video, but it does translate live. And they will, if you give them the easy way to subscribe to you, they will be listening to you on the way home. Oh man, I met Chris. He's so cool, man. I'm going to listen to him. I mean, they, they get engaged with you. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Chris, this is another music business story. I was doing this thing and I don't even remember who it was. It was a country guy. And uh, there was a woman in the audience. This is a live broadcast for Sirius, actually. And there's a woman in the audience. And I thought she was staff because she was talking about this guy. Oh, man, he's such a mama's boy. Oh, man, when he was little, he had this truck. And, and I was like, then this lady knows this guy. So um, ended up talking to her. And I found that she didn't know him at all. She'd been, she thought she knew him. Oh. It's a parasocial relationship. <laughs> and she's, Talking like it's her best friend. That can also happen to us. I don't know if I would necessarily encourage that, but you might have experienced it. it. It's weird that you've heard my podcast, you said, and I've heard yours. So we knew a little bit about each other coming in, but but sometimes that's one way. So you might see somebody in an event, like a podcast or podcast, whatever, and they say, oh, Chris, yeah, I heard your podcast. And that happens a lot. And that can happen in the niche space as well. But you've got to get them to know about it. So anyway, to so show up at these events, that's one of the things I would do for the, the three guys, one brain. Yeah. Um, what about, um, 
you know, using the three guys, one brain to possibly, you know, cross promote on other shows that also have three guys. It could be two brains, one, uh, two, two, three, four brains, maybe of the show. Can they cross connect and maybe, you know, branch out that way? Yeah. Let me, so I will give you another example from the book. Cause I wrote about this. This is a radio guy that I know, Eric K. Johnson, that you might've heard. He, oh, yeah, he was on the show. While, he was on the oh, show. While, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So Eric is cool radio guy. And Actually, that this is how we met. We met at a live event. He was doing something here in Nashville for a broadcast event, iHeart or something like that, and uh, reached out. Okay, so now we know each other in person. It's a completely different relationship. But I was talking to him about this because I, I don't know. He must have mentioned this. I don't think he just sent this to me randomly. But we talked about the morning show. We've been talking about morning shows, and we could use Howard Stern as the example. It's a three-man team, usually two guys, one woman. They call it the dick, the doll, and the dork. <laughs> okay. You've got a guy who's kind of a jerk. You've got the dork who's kind of the, oh, shucks, guys. You know what I mean? He's kind of like good old boy. He's like, you know, just, and you've got the woman, uh, Robin Quivers. When the guys get out of hand, she's the doll. And she said, guys, come on now. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> she, Keep it real. She puts there everybody you. in their place. And I think if you're doing one of these multi-guy shows, it, we don't need three of the same guy. We don't, you know, I would actually be perfect for that kind of show where you're, you're getting high and, and drinking and eating meat because I'm a vegetarian and I'm a teetotaler. So you need a guy like me to come in there and balance those two idiots out. Right. Yeah, to totally. Every, everybody's got their lane. The female is great because it's a different voice. So if you've, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one female, two men, it could be two female, one men or a gay guy who's maybe going to have uh, maybe like a little bit of a, a, a different uh, dialect, you know, or a Southern guy or some guy who, uh, I, I work with a guy, Pedro Pena. I've talked about him a lot. He's got a podcast called My Stuttering Life. God, he's a person who stutters and you know it when it's Pedro and he talks about his life. He's the last guy you would think would have a podcast, but is one of the most interesting podcasts that I have ever heard because of that. So he would be a great guy for that. And again, it's sometimes the last guy you would think would be on that show. Like, I'm not going to get a guy who stutters on my podcast. Why not? Why not? Right, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's unique, right? So bring in the different people and that, uh, that gives you a, a, a special mix that cannot be replicated. It's magic. It's magic when it happens. Not all partnerships work great. You know that. But when they do, man, it's, I mean, Robin Quivers would, I don't think Howard Stern would be Howard Stern without Robin Quivers. Yeah, you're right. You're definitely I mean, right. I mean, she, if she left, there would be a huge hole. Baba Booey. <laughs> Gary, Gary left. He's not even officially the guy, right? Right. But if, he, if he left, that would be different. And I'm talking like, like I'm a huge Stern fan. You know, he's, he's great at what he does. He's great at what he does. And he's taken it to a new level. But there's something we can learn from him. Yeah, he does. He's a really good interviewer for sure. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, and really gets in there. And he's, uh, he's become a good interviewer. And I think that's a really good lesson too. And that if it used to be, if you were to watch him 20 years ago when he first started the TV show, he'd be like, hey, take off your top. <laughs> yeah. Take yeah. A, you know, he would ask these questions. And this is, this got Donald Trump in, in trouble because Trump can't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> you got to be careful when you're on a, a skilled host like, like Stern. But if you listen to him now, oh, amazing. I mean, he goes deep. And we're a really wonderful interviewer. And that's, uh, if I could listen to his interviews all day and, and learn from him, he's amazing. So speaking of interviews, do you have any uh, tips and tricks for the podcaster out there who is doing interviews? What uh, strategies or tips do you have for him? I will use the example from yesterday. So it's on fresh on my mind. Two days ago, we did a pre-interview. That's a little bit late for me. I always do a pre-interview. I was introduced uh, to her by somebody that I knew in the industry. She said, I think you're going to like this person as a guest. So I knew a little bit of information, but not a lot. And I called her up and I acted like I knew her. Hey, David, you know, she's like, okay. She knew me. It's a parasocial thing, right? And I knew her a little bit from my friend Kim who introduced me. We talked for 50 minutes. It wasn't necessarily, we're going to do this, this, this. What kind of mic do you have? This, this. I'm just hanging out with her. She mentioned first thing. She said, yeah, me and my dog. Oh, what kind of dog you got? Oh, I got a dog too. You're building that rapport. And by the time it came down to actually nitty gritty doing the work that we needed to, to get something on tape, it was like, I knew her, she was going to be more open to me. She trusted me. 
The same thing, and you and I, I think, had this conversation before we started recording, but on the back end, I tell people always, I said, if you say something that you didn't mean to say, that you don't want going out, let me know then. Because this is a safe space for you. I'm also going to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask it, but if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to answer it. You have the autonomy, so don't feel pressure on me. Of course, there's always going to be a little pressure. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. and there is, there is. And silence is, is a great pressure mechanism, but I'm not trying to make somebody feel bad. I'm trying to develop rapport with them. So I would say if there's one thing for better interviews, 100% do a pre-interview. Do not do it right beforehand. Do it at least, I would say, three or four days if you can, for whatever reason. Sometimes people are busy in, in my line of work. They're like on tour. They're only in town for like a day or two. Like, oh, okay, I can do this. Or, you know, they it's not going to be the optimal pre-interview. They're on a bus or something, but um, at least at least a day ahead. Because what you don't want to do is do a pre-interview right beforehand, where people forget what the pre-interview was and they forget what the interview is, and they don't realize there's that demarcation point, and they'll be like, "Oh, like I said, so what? Well, well, you didn't say that on the show. You said that right. in the pre-interview, right? So, right. But yeah, it's going to give you some. It's going to give you direction that you would never imagine, and the thing like. Little things like the dog, man. Uh, I mentioned being vegetarian. If, if she was, it'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. If she's from Nashville. And she, where do you like to go? Where do you, where do you get good vegetarian? You know, it, it's rapport building. You're just, we're in, the, we're all in there together. It's not me versus them. When I'm doing an interview, we're trying to make a great show, and that's not just for me and the guest. That's me, the engineer, the producer. Everybody's working as a team. A lot of times, people think it's just me because that's the voice that they hear, but we are all working to get my, my wife is a photographer. So I'll use it, get the tape or she would say, get the shot. And uh, the model is no more important than the photographer than the makeup person, than the stylist, than anybody else. Everybody, everybody's working as a team. And that's what I would say for a better interview. Right. Exactly. Now, what are your thoughts on going, knowing too much about the guests where kind of almost kind of, you know, you don't quite answer. I ask those questions that, the, the uh, listeners would want to know because you already kind of know them. You know what I'm saying? Well, you, you have to, okay. You have to think like your listener. So for example, um, l- let's say I've got a rock star. Let's say Steve Miller comes in. I've never interviewed Steve Miller, but, so I'm not name dropping, but let's, I'm going to use this example. Steve Miller's got a new record out. He wants to talk about that record. I'm curious about that because I've heard the story of Fly Like an Eagle a thousand times. But the listener wants to hear about Fly Like an Eagle. Right. They want to hear about the Joker. They want to hear whatever, you know? So I I think you do have to think about, and this is another thing for great interviews. I think you want to be, if you're doing anything with a celebrity or any, even an author, talk about the new stuff, talk about what they're doing now, but also give homage to the stuff that really everybody cares about. And usually people get that. I mentioned interviewing Richard Marks. (laughs) Richard Marks. Yeah. This dude told those stories a million times, but you never would have known about it. You never, and and we have people play live in the studio. We're set up for that. He did a medley. Not only did he give me one song, he gave me about five of them. Perfect edit. I mean, he was a pro, dude. Nice. Now, what I did with him that kept it engaging, and this is just specialized knowledge, is Richard Marks' father owned a studio, and... He was a, uh, this is in, I think it was in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. And he was a, like an ad man doing commercials and things. Chicago is a big ad place. So we started talking about that, like pop songs. And I, I found the hook. I, I said, okay, you, you're a pop songwriter. You can do the 330 song like I talked about. Let's talk about advertising because that's also quick. And you sang on ads when you were a kid. So let's talk about how hearing those jingles how did that influence your writing? So I can bring in something different so he can tell the story in a different way and he's a little bit more engaged than he would have been. If I was like, man, you, you, you date da- Daisy Fuentes, you made her, is she hot? Is she still hot, Richard? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, the, the, man, boxers are brief, Richards. I mean, are you, are you, are you what, what, what kind of underwear are you wearing now? I mean, that's what you hear on morning shows and these right. guys are like, oh God, sometimes you got to play along just because they got the airwaves. But that's, that's a great example of, hosts not doing their research. If you want to stand out as an interviewer, do your research, do the pre-interview when you can. If you can't do it with the person, go to their manager or go to okay. the, their, their handler or friends or fans. I get, I get on Facebook. This is another great way to build an audience. 
I say, I'm just going to continue to use Richard as an example. I say, hey, I got Richard Marks coming in this week. Remember him? Did you like uh, go to prom? Did you listen to him at prom? Tell me Richard Marks' story and let me know if you got any questions. So that's going to build up your authority and it gets your audience in there. And you can go back to those Facebook comments individually. Hey, man, I asked him and he gave a great answer. You're going to love this episode. Nice. So I get the audience involved. I try to have as much audience engagement as I can. Podcasting is weird because we can't have live call-ins. And I don't know that you'd want it because, man, I don't know if you've ever done live call-ins, Chris, but. Uh, they have a phone screener. <laughs> phone, phone screener for that, you know. I mean, you know. I mean, Even you then, that, I mean, that first record I talked about, that was a prank call record. And there are people that can, can get by them. And uh, it's funny, the da- Dave Jackson mentioned him. I heard Dave Jackson on his live stream. He gets prank called sometimes. And. I can tell, I can tell how it's working. And um, I said, that guy's getting ready to prank him. And sure enough, uh, you got to be careful. But, but you know, that makes it fun too. Sometimes a prank call, sometimes getting a blooper out there accidentally, like happened to Casey Kasem. That's oh, a, the good old Casey human. Kasem uh, audio call. I have it saved in my uh, folder somewhere. The, oh, yeah. The dog, do- dog death one. <laughs> yeah, de- the death dedication. Coming out of a death dedication. Yeah, so if you don't know the story, he's coming out of a, a Pointer Sister song called Dare Me. And it's a nice upbeat disco number. And that's what he says. He goes, we're coming out of a disco number into a death dedication. He gets mad at the staff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drops and this is why you want to be nice to your people because, you know, that was leaked on the feed and it went over the whole network. And here's what he said about that afterwards. He's passed, of course, is he, he said, it, it made me human. It showed that I wasn't perfect and I wasn't flawless because you listen to Casey Kasem. Uh, the letter U and the number two, you two with, I mean, he is perfect. Uh, I'll tell you another funny Casey Kasem story as well. You know, Casey Kasem was shaggy in the uh, Scooby-Doo. Oh, really? The original cartoon, right? He, he, the cartoon, he was shaggy. And then they brought in another person. And what did shaggy like to do? He liked to eat Scooby snacks and hamburgers. Right. Casey Kasem, they wanted him back. Casey Kasem was a big vegetarian. This is, this is an example of you playing your flag as a host, planning your flag. Casey Case is a vegetarian. He said, I'm not coming back unless you make Shaggy a vegetarian. He eats veggie burgers. <laughs> no way. And they did it. Another thing, Casey, he turned down Kellogg's because a cereal is consumed with milk. He said, nope, not going to do it. So that's an example of playing your flag and uh, planning your flag. And planning your flag is something that you need to do now. Do it now before you get famous because then people will know who you are and they won't even bother to ask you ridiculous things that you don't want to get involved with. Fantastic, David. That's great, man. You have stories for days, man. Well, this one makes you a good host. You got to be knowledgeable about weird stuff that you'll never be able to use otherwise. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> yeah. man. Dude, hey, so David, where can everybody find out all about you and all your wonderful stuff? Bigpodcast.com. That is the website. And there is a podcast there. There is a weekly newsletter there. There are articles there. I've got a book called Big Podcast. There's a lot of Big Podcast stuff at bigpodcast.com. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you so much for showing up here on Podtastic Audio. I appreciate you uh, spending your time today. It was fun, man. Thank you, Chris. Hey, thank you once again for listening to this episode. And if you know anybody, or perhaps maybe you're on the fence of maybe creating a podcast, and you're like, I don't even know how or where, don't you worry. I will hook you up. You want to head on over to podtasticaudio.com slash easy, and I will personally help you design and create and even record your podcast for you and i will catch you on the next episode